Welcome to the second session, part one, of the third year literature and publishing course, which is part of the English literature degree at the University of Greenwich. This and the next session, next week, concerns the sensation novel by Mary Elizabeth Braddon, Harry Dunbar, published by Braddon's lover, John Maxwell. Although the novel is available freely on the internet through archive.org and other places, and of course you can buy second-hand copies of late printings of the novel cheaply, I want particularly to recommend you go to Anne-Marie Bella's excellent annotated edition, published in 2010 by Victorian Secrets. Its introduction and notes are very helpful indeed. Now, I'm not going to repeat what Anne-Marie wrote there, as you can read it yourselves. Neither am I going to repeat what you can find easily enough on the internet with a simple search. And a lot of what I'm going to say isn't easily available in secondary sources in print either. Look, you don't need to watch a YouTube video that simply repeats what someone else has said or written. Instead, as always, I want to provoke you into thinking about the text, not just repeating what's been said already. This session comprises three parts, just like the session on Poe. The first, this one, comprises the justification of Henry Dunbar on the course. Included in this is the beginning of a very short history of detective fiction, which we'll be revisiting and extending throughout the course. The second part returns to our key words and starts to think of Henry Dunbar as a sensation novel by considering how sensation can be generated by putting two or more discourses in conflict with one another and considering the discourse of sensation in itself. The third will, perhaps surprisingly and perhaps in a contrary manner, take a now infamous denunciation of sensation fiction seriously in order to investigate the origins and place of the novel in literary and publishing history. So, first let's look in this part at why Henry Dunbar's on the course. Henry Dunbar is not part of the usual canon of detective novels, unlike the Poe last week. What might once more normally have been set would have been Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone, dating from 1868. And that features as one of its detectives, Inspector Cuff. You can find all sorts of histories of detective fiction, including written by some who ought to know better, which claim that the first detective novel is The Moonstone, even though they have to acknowledge that Paul's Auguste Dupin was the first fictional detective and that Poe wrote the first detective stories. They'll say that The Moonstone is the first detective novel. Hmm. Well, for a start, more recent histories recognize earlier fictional detectives, including women. These two, for example, date from 1864. There were several reasons they had been included in the canon of detective fiction before, for not only must we consider gender bias, but also class as you can probably guess from the condition of these uh, covers. They are collections of short stories, so well, that's what they are, published as popular fiction. And you'll see from the covers that the authorship is not very important. Now, I'll return to them briefly later to reveal who wrote them. But the point is that the covers you see are not interested in who wrote the text. Wilkie Collins, by contrast, is well known to literary historians for several reasons. First, he's a friend of a writer central to the canon of English literature, Charles Dickens. And second, he's been endorsed by other famous writers. In his introduction to the 1928 Oxford World Classics edition of the novel, no less than T.S. Eliot called The Moonstone the First the longest and the best of modern English detective novels. And many subsequent critics have taken this at face value. Whereas, in fact, this claim is more akin to a claim in a blurb. Uh, 
Elliot's statement comes right at the head of an introduction to a book that needs to sell. He's trying to get people to buy the novel and read it. And some critics also add a phrase to what you see on the screen in front of you. They add a phrase that I've been unable to trace back to the original. I quote, in a genre invented by Collins and not by Poe. Now, if Eliot did write that, and it's not in any edition of the introduction I've been able to find, but that doesn't mean to say that it doesn't exist somewhere, such a statement is only to be expected by those of you aware of T.S. Eliot's cultural preferences and alliances, since Eliot, for all his American origins, would also be trying with that statement to claim the origins of the detective genre who were in Britain rather than in the U.S. Or perhaps we should think about the desires of the critics who quote this statement. In any case, in taking Eliot's casual pronouncement seriously, subsequent literary historians of detective fiction have wiped out or covered over the far more complex history of the genre, including women detectives and detective fiction by women. I don't want to follow those exclusionary and simplifying practices. And that's why I wanted to put a novel by a woman author which has an amateur woman detective as a central character on the course. It also, of course, precedes the Moonstone. Now, to place Henry Dunbar in a bit more of a historical context, I think I'd better offer you a very brief overview of the history of the genre, at least up to the 1860s at this point. Later sessions will, as I say, add more and more to the timeline as we move towards the last text set on this course, which came out in 2016. Now, here I'll also add a few words about real-life detectives. As you already know, Poe is usually considered the founder of the modern detective story with his three tales, The Murders in the Rue Morgue, The Mystery of Marie Rocher, founded on a real murder that took place in New York, for which Poe transplanted to Paris, and which he gets Dupin to solve purely from newspaper reports. And then there's the purloined letter that I briefly commented on in the introduction to the course last week. Now, one of the reasons Poe set his tales in Paris was that in 1811, a reformed criminal called Eugène François Vidocq informally organized a plain clothes unit. Let's think of them as spies on the criminal underworld, the so-called Brigade de la Sûreté, the Brigade of Security. Most members of the brigade were ex-criminals themselves, just like Vidocq, in fact. And you can see here how the detective and the criminal are mirrors of one another in real life, not just in fiction. Remember how Poe suggested that one had to enter into the mind of one's opponent in order to beat them? Here we have criminal and detective literally, and not just imaginatively, exchanging roles. Poe, of course, knew that. The police soon came to value the brigade, and in 1813, Napoleon made them formally a state security police force. And since then, it's been called the Sûreté Nationale, or Sûreté for short. In Britain, though, the police remained very informal and local until 1829. It comprised locally appointed constables who answered to local magistrates. Although someone we know better in English literature as a novelist, Henry Fielding, had founded the Bow Street Runners in 1753, Besides being a writer, Fielding was also a magistrate, and he used his powers as a magistrate to set up what's often called the first official police force in Britain. It was a team of just six men, but they did manage to get funding sometimes from central government. And because they did manage to get this funding from time to time, they are called the first official police force. There were other developments after that, but it really wasn't until 1829 and the founding of the Metropolitan Police Service uh, that anything significant happened. The Metropolitan Police Service was founded by Robert Peel, 
They soon came to be called Bobbies after Robert Bobby Peel, so you may also find the term Peeler after, again, his surname. This was, again, a very small force compared to today's standards. Yet, to almost 1,100 men, it was the largest police force yet seen in Britain. Now, I'm not giving a history of the real police or detectives on this course, so suffice it to say two things. That the next major development we need to think of was the establishment in 1842 of a detective office within the Metropolitan Police. This took over the function of the Bow Street Runners, who had morphed into a detective force, rather like the Sûreté, before they'd been absorbed into the Met Police Force in 1839. And it's in the detective office of the Metropolitan Police that Mary Braddon's Inspector Carter works. Braddon refers to him as working in Scotland Yard, and that's the second thing I want to mention. Well, the office of the Metropolitan Police was close to Parliament at 4 Whitehall Place, just off Trafalgar Square, opposite the Admiralty. However, the public entrance was not on Whitehall itself, but in a yard off it, Scotland Yard. It's the same place where what's considered the first fictional police detective also works. Inspector Bucket in Charles Dickens's Bleak House in 1852. Now, Bucket was based upon Inspector Jonathan Witcher, a Scotland Yard detective whom Dickens interviewed and about whom Kate Summerscale, whose wicked boy we're reading as the last text on this part of the course, has written a best-selling non-fiction book called, appropriately enough, The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher. This is the timeline so far, then. We've just added Charles Dickens' Bleak House to the timeline. But there's something else I want to add before we move on to the next. Even if Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone used to be thought the first detective novel proper, there's another novel by Wilkie Collins which might also be considered such, even if it doesn't feature a professional detective. And that is The Woman in White from 1859. The hero, Walter Hartwright, employs many of the techniques familiar from later and professional detectives in his search to uncover the identity of the woman in white. But the real detectives, I think, are us, the readers. As what Collins calls the preamble states, the novel comprises a series of documents as if presented in a court of law. As he says, the story here presented will be told by more than one pen, as the story of an offence against the law is told in court by more than one witness. That is, we're placed by the multiple narratives so that we have to uncover a single coherent thread that runs through them. I did consider putting The Woman in White on the course for that reason, but in the end, I chose Henry Dunbar. I chose Henry Dunbar for several reasons. Not only does it precede The Moonstone by several years, but it has various investigators, various kinds of detectives, both male and female, amateur and professional. But it's also typical in other ways, not least that it enables me to mention the first two professional women detectives in fiction, which both came out the same year as Henry Dunbar was published in serial form. There's no time to explore these here, but if anyone's interested in reading more, then I thoroughly recommend this volume. Sherlock Sisters is an entertaining and very easy read, and the copies in the library, and as well as a great deal of other work on women detectives. Henry Dunbar, then, is not part of the usual canon of detective novels, unlike the Poe or the Conan Doyle, the Chandler and the P.T. James. Rather, it's like the Richard Marsh and even more surprisingly, the Kate Summerscale, it's on the edges of detective fiction. And for that reason, I think it can help us think about what's going on with the genre. As I've said, 
There are a series of detectives in Henry Dunbar. Here they are. I think the most obvious is Margaret Wentworth Wilmot Wilson. She keeps changing her name. The daughter, she thinks, of a murdered man who becomes convinced that Henry Dunbar had murdered her father in chapter 14, especially when she hunts down and finds the letters in the battered and dilapidated hair trunk belonging to her father. Of course, from chapter 32, she becomes a criminal herself, concealing the identity of the murderer and even later aiding and abetting him to escape from the police. So easily do detective and criminal reverse roles and become one another. But there's an earlier detective as well. The first one is Arthur Lovell, solicitor. We're shown him watching Henry Dunbar in chapter 11 very suspiciously. It's clear that he's very suspicious, but he effectively exiles himself from the investigation very early on in the narrative. It's not in his interest to pursue it. Then again, we have Clement Austin, banker. He's converted to suspicion of Henry Dunbar by Margaret. And the title of chapter 18, Three Who Suspect, explicitly links him, her, and Arthur Lovell. They are, of course, united not only in suspicion of Henry Dunbar, but also, interestingly, by love. One of the reasons Arthur is suspicious of Henry Dunbar is because he loves Laura, Henry Dunbar's daughter. And of course, Clement is in love with Margaret. Margaret, meanwhile, loves her father and is seeking to avenge what she believes is his murder. These aren't pleasant pastimes or games of wits as Dupin exercises. We can detect also out of various forms of love. Later, we find Henry Dunbar's own daughter, Laura, become a kind of accidental detective in her search in Paris for her father's portrait in chapter 36. The painting, and the loss of which had been introduced in chapter 1, well, she's just not good enough at weighing up evidence to be a real detective and realize that the portrait is actually accurate. She's too locked into the fashions of the day, and she doesn't accept that the art of the past can give an accurate likeness. She dismisses the old, both the old style of art and old age, in her collusion with the old artist's son. A major problem. She uses the wrong discourses to interpret the evidence. Finally, introduced very late, we find Mr. Carter of Scotland Yard, professional detective, who's introduced as late as chapter 37. He's a policeman, an agent of the law who's concerned not only with knowledge, finding out who the criminal is, but also with tracking him down and apprehending him. He gets the wrong man, as it turned out. But in fact, the man he gets hold of is a much less repentant, much less sympathetic reprobate than the criminal he was searching for. And finally, we readers, who should, in theory, read everything suspiciously, using all the resources, the discourses and archives at our disposal, all the discourses lodged in our memories, all the archival tools that we have access to. The question is, what are we detecting? What are we finding out? Are we encouraged to find out the nature of the crime, for example, how the crime was committed, as in the Poe? Well, probably not. Many of us realised what happened early on. Braddon makes it very obvious with her repeated insistence on the similarity between Joseph Wilmot and Henry Dunbar. And let's do a bit of close reading on this, in fact. I'll let you read these on your own. I suggest you pause the video and read them through. But this is, look, chapter five. 
in chapter 7, immediately Henry Dunbar encounters Joseph Wentworth. Look at the paragraph. Look at the paragraph that comments on that encounter. The handsome face was as handsome as his own and almost as aristocratic looking, for nature has odd caprices now and then and had made very little distinction between the banker, who was worth half a million, and the runaway convict, who was not worth sixpence. This occurs in the conversation between Henry Dunbar and Joseph Wilmot in the Dolphin Inn in the High Street in Southampton. It looks like that Henry Dunbar has actually spotted what Joseph Wilmot is thinking about, but doesn't register the reality of what he spotted. He can't imagine that anyone would want to murder him. He's so self-satisfied. By the time they get to Winchester, it's hard for strangers, such as us readers, to tell Wilmot and Dunbar apart. Dunbar himself doesn't realise that Wilmot is only playing a part. As the narrator tells us, he wasn't a close observer, for it's necessary to read people closely, as if they were texts. A close observer would have detected that Wilmot's laugh was a little forced his loudest merriment wanting in geniality. But Henry Dunbar was not a close observer. The narrator instead forces us into the position of strangers to Wilmot and Dunbar, even though we've known them for eight chapters now. The narrator plays a move in a game, as if in a game of drafts with us, so that we're not permitted to tell the two men apart. The game continues in the passages around the gap between chapters where the murder is committed, the blank space of silence between chapters where the obscene act is performed. Are we fooled by it? Has the narrator defeated us in the game? Yet the narrator has given so much away, has been so attentive to give so much away. Many of us, aren't fooled, though I also have to admit that some people are. The wonder is that either way, whether or not we know the moves that the narrator has made, and are we, whether we are or not deceived by it, whether we remain confused by what's happened, the novel is still worth reading from beyond this point. Why bother to read it if we know exactly what's happening? Maybe there's a different set of questions that we need to ask. Indeed, the question that remains, if we've guessed the crime, is whether the criminal will get away with the crime. And if not, for how long can he keep up his false identity and escape the law, and perhaps justice? And that brings us to another key issue that the novel debates, and which is worth reading for, whether the law is always just. For perhaps a murder may be, may be committed whose motives we come to understand and be sympathetic to. Who's the real criminal? Is it Joseph Wilmot or Henry Dunbar? Or rather, perhaps we should ask who committed the original crime? that sets the plot in motion. Maybe a murderer wouldn't be a murderer if someone had been kind to them when they were young. Maybe the fault of the murder lies in a person who was cruel many years before. At a time when the punishment for murder was death, who was responsible ultimately was a key question for justice, if not for the law. And I'll return to this in a later section. Now, though, I want to move on to thinking about Henry Dunbar as a sensation novel. <laughs>